We're live and recording. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Alex here again from Festival of Enterprise. I'm joined by James McMaster from Huel. Um, thank you for coming, James. Really appreciate your time. Pleasure. Nice to be here. And, and thank you, everybody, for your messages. Loads of people posting up. Let us know whereabouts you are in the country. Always interested to know. I've yet to see a hi, it's uh, raining or anything like that today. Yeah, everyone seems to be um, basking in this glorious weather. Um, I'm in um, in Poole in Dorset, and it's, uh, it's like 20, 21 degrees, I think. Uh, whereabouts are you, James, at the moment? Uh, I live in London. Uh, I'm in my, my, my daughter's bedroom, so forgive some of the things you can see in the background. <laughs> it's, the, it's the best Wi-Fi um, in the house, and I've got a nice um, view out the window there. So I've been um, sat, in, um, sat in my daughter's bedroom the last month. Very good. Yeah, I'm sat in our front room, wheeled a desk in uh, since we started here. Um, but do you normally work, um, it's like remote working, do you normally work from London or do you spend some time up near, it's near Buckinghamshire, isn't it, or Hertfordshire where your, your HQ is? So, yeah, so we're at a place called Tring in Hertfordshire right. and I'm there, there most of the time. We do have an office in London as well and we have an office in Birmingham and an office in York. So I spend a bit of time around the other offices, but most of the time I'm in our HQ in Tring. But it's interesting, like what, what's happened in the last last few weeks is that change perceptions on things. And one of my uh, um, thoughts is around, around New York. So I go to New York every couple of months to see the team and mm. see suppliers and, and contacts there, but maybe we should do more, more um, video calling and maybe there's no need to be traveling around uh, physically to so many places. Yeah, no, it is interesting. I was, I was interviewing a um, chap called Magnus Grimmeland from Antler, which is like a global startup generator and, and VC fund for, for early stage tech businesses. And he was saying, you know, I've jumped on a plane and flown across a continent just to have one meeting. And he's going like, now I, I hope and pray that things change in that regard, at least, you know, so it's, um, it is an interesting conversation. Um, so yeah, hello to Birmingham, to Scotland, to Clapham, to High Wycombe, um, all sorts of people here. Um, do post up your questions, guys. The easiest way is if you post them up in the chat function there rather than the ask a question button. Um, but if you do post them there, I'll just copy and paste them up for, for James to see. But um, we've got a lot to talk about today. Hi, Brian from Warrington as well. So James is a CEO of Huel. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, but you've now served... 100 million meals across 100 countries is that right and uh speaking of the numbers that when i interviewed julian last year at your pretty amazing hq i have to say um it was a 50 50 million dollar business and now 100 million i think i saw julian posting about is that right that's true yeah so we've, we've been around for four and a half years now and and yeah the growth has been phenomenal the whole way through we've become an international uh, predominantly e-commerce brand shul is all about complete nutrition we make food, uh, either a bar or it's a, a powder that you mix with water to make into a drink, uh, or we we have um, a ready to drink as well. And people generally have it as a, as a lunch or a breakfast or a dinner or a snack. And it's just been a, been a phenomenal ride the last few years. Yeah, and I think I was first introduced to you guys from uh, Emily Austin at Emerge PR, who's, who's a friend of me, friend of mine, um, and seen a, a lot of coverage um, off, off the back of that as well. So. Um, it seems like your re your reach is pr pretty incredible now. Um, so, what, what what interested to know? Like, first question maybe is when coronavirus, COVID nineteen, whatever you want to call it, the lockdown happened. Um, what did you do with the business? And as a CEO, what what was your role in that? Interested to know. Well, the early stages actually were more about uh, thinking about Asia. So, we we brown rice is one of our ingredients, and and that comes from China. So. I'm sure everyone was in a similar position in sort of February. I kind of lose track of time exactly, but our mm. biggest concern was: Are we going to run out of brown rice? And the uh, the ships weren't um, running as much as they were, and there was delays. And then suddenly, you know, fast forward a few weeks later, it's all about: Hang on, the whole the whole world's going into lockdown. So yeah, predominantly it was raw ingredients. And then I was I was actually on holiday, and I noticed that in the uh, hotel we were in. They had a thermometer at breakfast every morning and you couldn't get into breakfast and until they did the thermometer mm -hmm. in your head to tell you and uh, that sort of dawned on me that things were changing quickly and i rang uh, rebecca who's our head of people and said look we need to buy a thermometer for all our offices now and start measuring people and and, and obviously that's going to transform to being about 
going into offices with masks on and things like that. So we, um, yeah, we went from this running up ingredients to, oh my God, our sales are going, are going crazy. So we had some, some really, really big weeks sort of double, triple our normal levels. And we're, we're high grade business anyway. So we were, uh, seeing quite big changes on the, on the logistics front. So our warehouses were suddenly dealing with way more volume than they, than they normally have. We started seeing delays for, for customers. Um, the more, Every time Boris Johnson spoke in the UK, we'd see a huge sales spike in the couple of hours after that. You can see the sort of progressing fear and, and worry from, um, from the public. And I think for us, we're a direct consumer brand. We do have some retail. So we're in uh, places like Sainsbury's. We've recently launched into to BP. We've been in Selfridges um, since uh, last year. So we do have that, but predominantly we're direct consumer. And what happened is people are saying, I don't want to leave my home. I want my stuff delivered to my door. So we've seen always people going into direct consumer food in a different way than they've ever done before. Hmm. And uh, you, I'm assuming, able to track, and you you can see um, how many new customers, or was it existing customers like buying more? Is, is, is essentially, we had both. So we had existing customers pulling forward their subscription. So we we operate a subscription model, and people would you know, ordinarily waiting their subscription would be in April. They pulled it forward to March, and then we oh. had a lot of new customers new customers as well trying us out for the first time or friends recommending and um, we've seen more more people talking about us on the social people proud to to have it and go hey why don't you try this uh, interesting we, we've always been quite strong in the um in the healthcare space so if you know if you're a doctor or a nurse and you're you're in the hospital it's very difficult to know when you can eat uh you don't be preparing food there you might want to take a really really quick lunch or a really quick break so uh, we had a lot of love from people in hospitals saying wow I, I was using before but now it's even more um useful particularly if you're wearing protective equipment where you, you can't take all up um so just be able to, to drink your lunch is um a huge benefit for them yeah i mean i travel from from here in, in in dorset up to up to london a couple of times a couple of times a week and i would like always have my backpack and it's got like two pockets on the side and i would have two uh Two bottles of Huel either side that I've, you know, one, one still just with the powder and the other one to, to see me on the train journey up there, you know, because sometimes you, you don't have the time to have full proper breakfast like I normally would if, I, if I'm if i travelling and then likewise if I'm running around London all day and everybody seems to be an hour and a half in, in each direction, then it's it's one, it's convenient, two, two, it's nutritious and, you know, from a brand value point of, you know, it ticks, ticks all the bo boxes as well with regards to the pa packaging vegan etc all those kinds of things um question is just coming from elizabeth due to the difficulty of sourcing your ingredients are you now going to reevaluate where you get those from when we come out of this pandemic great question yeah i think i think that's sort of perhaps even a bigger question that is how do you make sure you stay in stock which is our, our number one challenge right now and you know arguably we've got quite a complex supply chain of different ingredients and different factories and we we've got five different warehouses around the world and how do you make sure you've got the right ingredients t-shirt mode today we give that away to each each first time customer we've got shakers there's all sorts of things to get right so uh i think the world is going to change from from a cash point of view we were quite lucky in that we raised the money about a year and a half ago two years and we raised more than we needed but we took the view of saying we don't want to spend all our time fundraising like some companies do so let's just raise more than we needed and that's been great for now because because basically what we've done is say look we normally have a certain stock holding target let's double it and and for some things like you know t-shirts and shakers we've just got huge stock holdings that we're, we're planning on so we're using our cash to make sure that we we don't run out of stock we've we, we, we've got really great team we recruited last year to get deeper into procurement and they're spending more time on you know luckily in the last year or two they've been work, working on getting closer to the supply chain to understand it so we've got really great relationships now and we can sort of pull forward volume much better than we did you know a few years ago where we're basically just buying um spot off the market so it's been a very big sort of operational focus in the last month but actually most of the work was done before then in terms of having enough cash having the right team having the right system to organize ourselves as well so we spent ages um implementing things like netsuite and tableau and and building up the team to make sure we can handle it so we've been we've been quite lucky and also yeah, moving moving those warehouses to bigger warehouses the stronger system has meant that we could deal with the flex so we're now trying to say well what will happen the rest of the year will, will you see like a sort of steady normal growth or do we have sort of peaks and troughs and we're saying we're set up now to handle big peaks and troughs and we weren't set up in the same way before uh questions are flying in um both privately on the on the tab i've got here and also on the chat um 
yeah it's interesting that like when we started doing these live webinars maybe i think this is our fourth week um and, and literally about halfway through that process about two weeks in um some of the some of the you know most people on here are, are, are business owners and people were saying um that all of a sudden factories had started being able to get the goods shipped again whereas there was literally nothing and i had a couple of big clients that i was making podcasts for and they literally just put all their plans on hold because they just saw factories shutting not being able to produce the goods uh, that they that they wanted so everything was just press pause you know like new website new new product development um obviously a podcast everything you can run a business without a podcast or a new website um so uh it's a good question actually i want to die Josh has got, um, you might be able to provide the answer for James. How did Huel discover its target market um, at the start? I can't remember the answer to that, even though I interviewed Julian, so you'll be closer to that. Yeah, um, do you know, we be a lot, I think a lot of brands, there's a question I've seen there about branding and, and advice for, for food and drink brand. I think a lot of people go a bit sort of too analytical about it and they go, well, here's the population. I want to target these people. I'm going to go and do things to target them. We're a food company that hits a lot of people. I mentioned sort of nurses earlier. We get people who work in banks. We get school teachers. We get a lot of people working in offices. We get people who are out and about a lot. So I think being broad maybe to begin with is a helpful bit. Um, we 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 started out morphing from a from a different business. So Julian set up a company called Body Hack that was all about looking at different uh, different ways you eat and different diets and trying to show that what you eat is a bigger impact on your your um, your health and your body than necessarily working out. And then he realized, hang on, what I want is stuff that's faster. So he would cut things like kind of chicken and broccoli and prepare. And, and, and that takes time. His mates are telling him, hang on, I just want really fast, convenient nutrition. And that's where Huel came from. And, and he sort of launched it as a hobby. So you know, Julian had, um, had sold a business previously and technically could have retired and done nothing, but he got a bit bored. Yeah. And I think when you do something that's natural, it's got more success rather than setting out to start a business to make money. If you're doing it to to say what you instinctively feel and then very quickly people started to buy into Huel and go hang on i do want fast nutrition i don't want to have um you know, unhealthy fast food and i don't want to spend a lot of money we're about one pound 30 per meal 400 calories i don't want to think about preparing i don't want to go to the supermarket and we're just ticking a lot of boxes and then i guess the overlay to that is that there's such a growing view about eating better for the planet and we're a vegan brand and if you reduce your uh, consumption of, of um, meat by 50%, your carbon footprint drops by 50%. So the um, there's just all these different ways happening at the same time. So I think we had a speech this week, spot, and it's only only growing in terms of some of those things there. And online shopping, we touched on earlier. So, you know, I remember there's a report 10 years ago saying that online shopping would get to, I think it's about 30 or 40% by now. And actually it's still at 10%. So mm -hmm. maybe it took something like this for people to go, do you know what? I don't need to go into shops all the time and driving and spending my time. I'm just going to order it on my phone or on my, my mm -hmm. um, my desktop and get it delivered there so i think it will change people's perceptions on that so i'm yeah. digressing a bit from the question but that was um yeah no no, no that's great and I, I remember julian um because he used to live here actually where i am pool in dorset because he went to bournemouth uni and then i think like you said he, he sold a business um and i remember him telling me you know when he, when he set this up it was um yeah, as a lifestyle business didn't envisage you know having huge staff and then now i think you you're, you're what probably 50 plus operation in the uk probably more than that now yeah so we're, we're 100 globally yeah. Uh, yeah. 90 yeah. which in the uk yeah yeah double since i spoke to you guys last um sunny says how much has Huel's launch of supermarket products boosted the company as opposed to just online powder good question again so we so we set out to be Huel.com direct consumer really easy saves customers hassle doing things good they get all the, the good value for money i think there are food and drink occasions where you are not planning your food typically lunches during the week and a lot of people busy they're traveling around they they don't know what to have so obviously you can't go hang on i'm going to order online it's going to arrive in five seconds it doesn't work that way so we thought about saying if we can be in certain stores it's quite a good way of people accessing us when they when they, when they haven't thought about what they're going to eat also when you buy from us you're buying in, in reasonable quantities and you're you're getting it delivered to you you don't necessarily know how it's going to taste or whether you, you're going to um fit it into your diet in the right way so having opportunity to buy one in an on-the-go environment is great for us so we uh, we see retail primarily as a way of introducing people to the brand yeah. but also as a way of when they're when they're on the go i mean look i i'm in i'm in hq most of the time and Clearly, we've got loads of fuel there, but you could do that in any office. I have fuel breakfast and lunch Monday to Friday, 
and I just don't have to think about it. I don't know it's healthy, I don't know it's good for the planet, and it's very simple. Um, but if I was out and about a bit more, and I, you know, I find when I travel, sometimes I haven't brought my fuel with me, and I'm eating something else. And I sort of, if your fuel was available in that store, it'd be a great accessible way to have it too. Yeah, and I've, you kind of see the success. I remember interviewing the, the CEO of Gray's, you know, and when they when they launched in the US, uh, and then Al Barrett from from Grenade as well, and seeing the success they've had with with having their products at that kind of point point of sale with uh, garages and you know, kind of a. a I can't can't move at the moment without seeing a grenade bar anywhere to be honest with you so they're, they're doing something right clearly um elizabeth uh says is there an opportunity that people will be able to buy a meal from a coffee shop there you go or there you go or from your own heel cafes in the future do you want to get involved in that space i suppose is the question uh we talked about a few things so you, know, you can either go what, from a channel point of view, you either sell yourself, like we do, fuel.com, or you say, I'm going to sell to retailers, which is traditionally what food and drink brands do, or you have your own shops like um, Nespresso does, or if you think about a brand like Gymshark, who do yeah. gym clothing, they, they just launched their um, pop up store in London, I think, uh, just before this all kicked off. So we could do a fuel store, something we've sort of toyed with. Um, I'd love to do one day, but obviously now's not the right time to be focusing on that. And in terms yeah. of actually cafes, we, we've got the ready to drink. Uh, bottles and then yeah. we've got bars i think that's an easy way of doing it you mm. there might be a way of i know sometimes you go to a shop or um uh is it joe and the juice you can get like a, a protein scoop in whatever you're ordering so you could do that you could have a fuel scoop there are there are cafes we've seen on social where they're like hey i got fuel in my whatever shake um or, or, or green juice or whatever in a cafe that we haven't we've got nothing to do with so clearly that uh, cafe owner is buying fuel off us and then adding um adding it on their menu so that, that's great as well yeah, no, I just, I suppose before the lockdown came, I was in San Francisco on, on a trip and when you go into like a Jamba Juice, you know, and you get the different, uh, th and I, I could envisage that with, with Huel as well, something like that, um, go down very well. Um, David said, would you offer a click and collect service in large offices? Again, I'm, that's probably something you might have crossed your mind, I'd, I'd imagine, uh, James. Yeah, I think a lot of offices effectively, you've got that in the, you know, most people, you know, if I look at our post room, there's a lot of brands being delivered every day into the office. So it's become a sort of social norm where if you want something delivered, delivered it's probably easier for a worker to get it delivered to their office yeah. because someone's there to give it to them, they can take it home. So that's our way of getting um, direct offices is um, just get it delivered to your office and, and it'd be kind of filling your desk by uh, the team where you go and collect it from an area there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and how has COVID-19 affected your package handling? I think the question, I guess, I presume they mean on the fulfillment side. So um, we, um, we've got a lot of social distancing going on in the warehouses. Uh, that, was, that was really tough for, for that phase because they, the, the capacity dropped by about 50%, but we've got some really wonderful logistics partners and they put in whole new sections of the warehouse to make it bigger. Um, bigger space for us to, to deal with the volumes and making sure people are just not not in contact with others. I've, I've seen a lot of brands, I think it was Next and H&M and brands like that who had to shut their warehouses because they were so tightly organised they couldn't work out a way of doing it. Now they're, all, they're trying to reopen again. So um, that's one way of doing it. Yeah, we've got the social distancing in all the, all the fulfilment centres. Um, and how did you initially source the ingredients for your, for your first product launch? So the so in the early days it was sort of here's the recipe and then buy off the spot market pea, pea protein rice protein flaxseed etc and then the more we got into it and i had prior experience from a, from a baby food brand called ella's kitchen and we did a lot of owning that supply chain and we'd go out and visit the farm and the fields and say that that field has done that one and we can this is the this is the specific um ingredient grade that we want because you get different different types of um, breed and um, and variety and taste and texture and sustainability and cost and the whole thing mixed together. So we own a lot more of the decision making now. We, we're constantly trying different pea proteins and which one tastes the right way, which one's lower carbon footprint. So we're, um, we're we just actually measured our carbon footprint for the first time. And um, we're going to do some work in the summer about sharing that with our, our Hooligan community. There's some cool stuff we're doing on the fact that we're closer to our ingredients for packaging than ever before. There's a lot of opportunity for us to do things differently. Yeah, I might as well dive into, you just referenced the, the hooligans there. Um, I know like from from my point of view with, with my Screw It Just Do It podcast, um, literally your 
my interview with, with Julian talk, talking about Cure literally from, you know, that initial idea up to where you were a year ago um, was the most downloaded podcast that we've ever done, you know, and I, and I wondered again how much the, the Hugans, you know, had to do with that. And, you know, we've had the likes of Richard Reed from Innocent, Ted, you know, Ray Kelvin from Ted Baker, you know, all sorts of um, people on. But um, it was really interesting once we started posting about our top 10 most downloaded posts, uh, most downloaded podcasts in the year, you just started seeing the Hure one climb, climbing up the rankings till it literally got to like New Year and it was far and away the most downloaded podcast in the last 12 months. So yeah, how beneficial has the encouragement of the hooligans been to your company culture, James? Yeah, so it was interesting for everyone. We, so we define a hooligan as anyone who works for Huel or anyone who's, who's a Huel customer. And I think it's a very modern way of doing things in that so we've got a forum on our website it's very open, a bit like the you know, conversations coming now. We we sort of answer things and and go back and forth, and there's a there's more of a relationship there. And I think that happens when you're a direct consumer. If you're selling to a supermarket and they sell to the customer, you've got no idea what what's going on there. They can still contact you on email or social or ring you up, but actually we we know everything about our customer. They know anything about us, and there's just constant two way dialogue. So a lot mm -hmm. of our product launches happen because customers say, "Hey, would you think about this or think about this?" And and we've done that, and actually, you know, fuel. Black Edition that launched in January, that came out of customers repeatedly saying, look, I actually want a higher protein version with oh. higher fats and lower carbohydrate. And yeah. other people were saying, well, I want, I want a version without a sweetener in it or without a, you know, an artificial sweetener in it. So we did that for them and it's been, you know, it's, it's our, our biggest, you know, one of our biggest product lines now. It just came really? out of our customers there. Yeah. So oh. I think it's the right way to do it. Just have a really open, um, open dialogue with customers, um, on everything that we talk about. Agreed. Um, do you, and I don't know the answer. Do you, do you sell from somewhere like Amazon as well, or is it you literally manage to keep it in house? So we're quite rare in that we don't do Amazon. Yeah, I think and didn't so. Yeah, for the reason of once you give it to Amazon, you've got no idea what happens from then onwards, and the customer doesn't have the direct link. I mean, you, there are people who will buy off us and then resell on Amazon for a higher price. And I had a look the other day actually, and there was a customer complaining saying, "Fuel customer service is crap, and never never buy from them again." And they'd bought off some random person on Amazon huh, right? and it sort of tarnishes our name. So I sort of hate it even more, but I, yeah. I get that for most brands, it's, it's, it's a, obviously a good thing to do. It's a big marketplace. Half of all searches are on Amazon or whatever the stat is. So yes, but we're, we're, we're going for the long term saying that we think it's better. We can provide a, a better customer experience by doing everything ourselves with, with customers, even though we're probably missing out on short term volume. Mm. Um, a question from, Alex, not me, but another Alex. Hello, Alex. Um, I've bought Huel Food for over a year now, and one of the main reasons alongside the value is the brand. What have you done since the start to help build a community and a brand? We've obviously touched on community a little bit there, but... Um, yeah. it, it's a brand that's hit a sweet spot that people want to talk about. And we, we said there about the podcast, but people like being associated with Huel. I think it says something positive about you. It's more of a mindset and a movement of saying, hey, nutrition first, pay for the close second, which is a phrase that we use. It's about not always paying lots of money for food. It's about thinking about the planet. It's about thinking about your body and your mind and eating eating well. So all those different aspects, people seem to want to share. And either they're sharing to their friends to recommend. So the number one reason why people buy fuel when they tell us in surveys is that someone told them about it. It yeah. might have been seeing it in an office. It's, you know, this huge white, or black uh, pouch with a giant shoe logo on it. It's just very like a magnet. People want to talk about it and see it. So that's massively helped us. Um, so another question about referral that sort of links in. So we do actually have a referral scheme as well, where you get a discount and the other person buying it for the first time gets a discount as a way of saying, look, thank you for recommending us. And also here's a, here's a you know, discount to try us for the first time. That's been huge for us too. So word of mouth is massive. And I think from a, from a community point of view, we started out with a very, very transparent setup. And, and if you look on our social pages, we're, we're very quick to defend ourselves. People are scared of change, and particularly with powder that you convert to a liquid that you drink for your lunch. For most people, and I get it, it's quite an alien thing to do. Yeah. And a lot of people try and shoot us down, but our team, you know, led, led from the very early stages, have been told, look, you'd be proud of your product. And we we kind of fight fire with fire, I guess, with that. And we've got a great social name. We've got 100,000 followers on on, um, on Instagram and hundreds of thousands globally on different platforms where people want to want to talk about Hugh and they want to see our responses and we're quite witty and quite courageous. So mm. sort of wear our heart on the sleeve. The other thing I think we did really well is we did this T-shirt here we give away with every um, yeah, first-line customer order. 
And yeah. once, you know, you just see them around the place. People are really proud of it. And they're basically, you know, walking adverts. And it's, it's an amazing T-shirt. Like quality-wise, we developed it. Spent two years developing our, our, our best possible T-shirt. So um, lots of different things help, help drive it. But it's, it's, a, it's a very word-of-mouth brand. I, I always remember, I hadn't thought of this before, I always remember getting a train from here in, in Paul back home to Cardiff to, to visit my family. And I just remember doing a, doing a post um and I, I didn't tag it to get attention it was just that li, li, this is the book i'm reading this is what i'm drinking on the train this is what i'm eating and literally you could have counted on my one hand how many minutes somebody got back to me but somebody just said what flavor are you you drinking alex from you know from from Huel. and i was just like the only other, other time i've seen that has been with virgin the only other brand that's ever like got back to me like that and i wasn't expecting it and i was just like, like wow that kind of it makes you feel good for one and it makes you want to share share things more it makes you feel part of the community i think that kind of leads into that that um community building thing that you mentioned yeah i well. think i think brands make the mistake again we own the brand they're the customer they're over here whereas we said no, the, the customers own the brand if we're doing something wrong and we look, we make mistakes all the time and sometimes our, our response time to the customers haven't been very very good particularly about a month ago um when volume started getting a bit crazy um so we've actually moved people from different parts of the team into our, our yeah. customer experience team to help but um we're very open and honest about it and i think if you just realize that the customer ultimately owns the brand then you do things in a different way mm. and actually going back uh, i've got a load of questions to get through again james but um w when i first um got in touch with you a couple of weeks ago and i just seen the post that you put that put out on on linkedin with regards to this crisis happening and, and and how you're looking after your staff but maybe you could for those who don't follow you on linkedin can maybe you could, you could touch a little bit more on that and what you've done and what the reaction's been from your staff because i'm assuming other other than the warehouse a lot of people have had to go and work remotely yes yeah, so if i go back a bit to probably we, we uh, the, the various companies we get inspired by or various other people and hopefully we start to become a company that others get inspired by as well netflix for me they they created a culture deck um, there are even versions of it publicly, which is arguably a bit OTT, but they're, they're very open public, uh, privately in their company as well. So we created a Huel culture deck about a year and a half ago, and, you, and it forces you to lay down what your beliefs, how, you know, how to be a hooligan, um, how do we approach things, what's the background, everything about the company in there. And uh, we're very transparent with the team as well. So we do, a, we do a, uh, an all-hands meeting every two weeks that we call All, all Hooligans and we share everything there's a q a section each time the day before where people can ask questions and usually it's me um who gets the, the the joy stroke difficulty of answering them sometimes um and then one of the things we noticed about a year ago on the mental health side of things i think there's a, a podcast that a couple of us listened to from steve bartlett yeah and he's the guy it's called diary of a ceo and and he he's really into supporting the team on mental health i think they've actually got people in, internally who are mental health support staff who are back their job um, so that inspired us. So we actually started sending some of our team to be trained up to mental health first aiders. And there's about, I think, 12 of them. Um, and they're there and they're spread across the different offices to support the team. And it's a bit like your physical health. Why should your physical health be treated stronger than your mental health when half of half of people have a, um, a mental health problem at some stage? So we, we really over-index on that. The other thing we have is we're a very sort of virtual business anyway. We've been on Zoom for years. Um, we do our all, all hooligans meeting on on Zoom every two weeks. So transitioning to where we are now has been has been easy, I think, for us the most because we're already working that way. But also because we spent a lot of time on trying to make our team more aware of it's okay if you've got a problem, like talk to us. Um, and here's a team you can go and talk to, or you can do a drop in session. And I I created a daily Zoom invite at four o'clock for anyone who wants to join to just have a chat uh, if they want to pro you know, one to one or, or or speak to someone else. Uh, we also did things like. We have a personal trainer and a yoga trainer who come to HQ every week. Awesome. And we just converted that to, to Zoom sessions as well. And the, the team are loving that, doing it in their apartments or gardens. And uh, it's so important. Like it's, it's a really tough time. I'm struggling personally to be stuck at home. And you know, mm. I've got I've got a, a garden and it's sunny. I mean, what if what if it's raining and you're in an apartment somewhere and you have and you're living on your own? Like some of our team are living on their own, particularly yeah. in New York. And you know, New York's all about living a great lifestyle, going out um with friends and drinking and eating and in socializing well, right now you can't do that and, and you a lot of them live in these real shoe boxes because that's the size mm -hmm. of new york apartment so we've been doing things like myself and rebecca i had people just doing one-to-ones with all the guys in new york and just saying hey how are you can, can i help and little yeah. things like you need a do you, do you need a desk do you need um you know do you need um um a chair or do you do you want to just chat to someone and, and all checking in so i think we're um 
we're on that journey and hopefully inspiring others but ultimately we've, we've been inspired by by the companies first yeah no and that that is a great podcast to check out is steven's dar of a ceo of i've interviewed Stephen before and built built a great company again there and normally lives in new york himself doesn't he but um yeah and, and i've felt you know definitely um during this time you, you know up days and, and down days and i'm always a glass half full i'm always very positive uh but like last week i think coming off the bank holiday weekend and it was taking maybe it was just taking a couple of extra days off like you know those four days i really struggled on the tuesday and the wednesday and i felt quite down and then I finished strongly on the thursday and friday but it was just interesting because i thought i was kind of like indestructible to to the kind of effects of this before and you know i'm very lucky again got a big garden a forest i'm looking out the window now we've got a forest straight opposite us we don't have any cars down the road you know there's no houses um but you know other friends again who are living in like high-rise buildings like you say in a shoebox and I had a friend posting on facebook and it was just a coffee cup in a window with a ray of sunshine and she's like this is my this is my happy place and i was just like that and she's got a garden top floor flat and i thought my god you can't even you know in some of some of them you can't even crack a window open can you to get to get a breath of fresh air at the end of the day so um it's brilliant that you were proactive in regards to that because so many businesses that i've i've spoken to um you know during this this live webinar series as well who have had to literally spend the last month getting used to this new technology whereas i'm same as you i've been using this technology for years now so it's not a great uh stretch but a, a lot of people have, have had to adapt really really quickly um loads of questions so I, I won't hog the questions but um let's have a quick look what have we got uh what do you is a good one from josh what do you think is the hardest aspect of the health food industry where do a lot of companies make mistakes so what have you seen in the last month maybe mistakes that have been made uh uh, well, I mean, so a lot of the things I've been saying that we've, we've been having, a, you know, we've been well prepared, we're having a, a good time because of the direct consumer food. We do have a retail presence, as I said, and actually we're down by about 50%. So right. food to go, which is where we, we sit in with our with our, either our bars or our bottles, we're, we're heavily down. Um, that's, that's the category. And I think it's just really tough, actually, if you are a business right now that's food and drink and you only have retail stores and you're only food to go, you're probably in a really tough place. So I really, really feel for those um, those brands. Mm. I think um, I think a lot of people go into food and drink and don't actually think about brands. They think about products. And I think you have to do both. It's very easy to do product and, and it be an own label uh, you know, Tesco or Sainsbury's branded product and people want to buy that. So how do you make it something where people want to be a part of and it's a a movement or something where they they, they have a, an emotional reaction to it that's difficult so i think if you if you look at it over the years when i've you know, just observed you either get people who are sort of too good at product and not, not good at brand or they're too good at um brand but their product doesn't do, does do anything interesting or distinctive also i think you, you get like a, a bandwagon of certain categories where people just jump in so you know kombucha or something has been huge in the last couple of years and everyone's diving in it's just this big mess of different all products all sort of doing the same thing it's mm. very easy to kind of do that um i think some people go into categories and don't know how big they are so uh let's say men, men's men's grooming so as a brand i think of a while ago where i thought they're quite big because i see them on the shelves everywhere and they did um moisturizers and shaving gel and stuff like that but it was tiny category you know in a supermarket shelf you might only sell one or one or two units per store per week yeah whereas you know coca-cola and bottles of water are selling 50 to 100 so i'm not sure people even look at the size of the category they're going into and if you're going into a category that's tens of millions of pounds with a few big players you might only be a couple of million pound business is that if that's what you want fantastic but i think some people don't even realize that when they when they go into it so what's mm. your what is your brand something that's distinctive does it visually look good do you do you have something personality about you or the, or the or the business is your product interesting and distinctive and then is the category worth going after yeah good great answer i mean i was it is interesting um like you say with, with the different business models i was chatting to cobra beer founder lord lord billamoria a couple of weeks ago and i think we've got him on again next monday and um you'd assume when you, when you see the stats like you know um alcohol consumption has gone up 25 percent in the uk 55 percent in america which i thought was a bit of a jump and, um, and he was saying, but you know, we're really struggling because we sell a lot of our lager through restaurants, through Indian yep. restaurants here and in India. And, and if that's a massive proportion of what you do, then it's gone. You're not gonna rain that back in elsewhere, are you? So 
Um, I think another, another thing that um, we we did early on at Huel, we also did it with with Goo and Ella's Kitchen. Where I was at previously, we went international very early on. So the risk is if you are a brand that gets picked up by a large supermarket, let's say you're a UK brand, and they give you they give you good support. Yes, that's wonderful, but you might be stuck with one retailer being seventy five percent of your business, and if yeah. something changes, you're gone. Yeah. And uh, so I think having different ways you can different channels or different retailers that you work with if you are in the traditional channel and then particularly going um going to national so ella's kitchen we went into sweden very early on we went into norway we went into um holland um goo we went into france we went into germany and then and then Huel was much easier arguably because it's direct consumer we sell to about 100 countries around the world now there's about 10 that we focus on and you know you could we're, we're very uh, split across that. So if one country had an issue, we'd, we'd sort of be protected. And I think that's, you know, obviously that's the holy grail to try and do that. But if you can start out going, I want to be an international brand, then it changes your mindset early on. Uh, have you had any challenges with regards to like distribution delivery at the moment, given that 100 countries you deliver to? Yeah, we, uh, yeah, lots. Um, depends on the country. So in Poland, it was really hard for a while. Deliveries were taking sort of three, four days longer. Right. Um, we've had certain. Uh, Two of our, our warehouses have had to shut for a couple of days when they had a case of um, COVID-19. They've, they've done a deep clean. Yeah. We've got each member staff being two, twice as far away as, from each other as they, as they were, which has slowed things down. Um, so we put on night shifts and we've got extra staff being recruited and more training going on and um, sort of holding the hand and supporting. But that's, that's been quite tough. And the same with the factories. They've been, you know, they've been operating at um, full tilt uh, and having to navigate through social distancing. So they've, they've all done a fantastic job. I'm really pleased with both our team and our and our partners to make sure we've kind of we kept going how we have. Yeah, yeah, well done. Um, Sunny says, is do you think D to C is the future of food beverage market, um, especially after COVID nineteen? And I was chatting to Melissa about that yesterday from Nourish. So uh, yeah, interested to hear what you say. I think it will break through a whole new ceiling. Like I said earlier, it's been limited for a, for a couple of years where people think that it should be bigger than it is. Um, there's, there's there's online grocery shopping, so if you shop at Tesco, Baby's, Waitress, Asda, etc., and you want to go on, you want to buy your delivery on 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 mine. I think that was running at about ten percent, and you could argue it should have been much bigger. What? Why is it not? And I think that will move forward. And then, if there are there direct consumer brands, there aren't many in the food and drink. Um, partly because a lot of it is impulse, and partly because you have to be ordering something in reasonable quantities to make it work. So. For us, we we you know, people generally spend sort of 50, 60, 70 quid when they're buying fuel. If you, you know, the cost of transporting and, and our team, I think it has to be that sort of level to make it work. If you are a business where your average order value is five pounds, you're not going to work online mm. because the fulfillment's too expensive. And if you're spending on marketing per customer, that doesn't that doesn't work. So because we're a food item you eat regularly, you 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 can justify that. But if you think about Think about uh, mattress brands and, and and you know there's so many of them have gone for a direct consumer model but you only buy it once every 10 years so spend all this time and energy and, and resource trying to get people to kind of buy you but then they don't buy you again so we're in a good place in that people buy us and have it it's a habitual thing you're having it you know, at least a couple of times a week if you're me you have it 10 times out of my 21 meals in a week so you're buying a lot of it regularly and then it all, all makes sense i think yes it will grow and a few companies are sort of trying to go direct consumer now I think if you're a real food to go kind of impulse product, it's probably never going to be a long term trend. And, and when people go back to their offices, it'll sort of go back to normal. But I'm sure there are more companies out there going, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm a kind of product that people buy often and they can buy it in bulk quantities and I can develop my, my model to do that. But it's a very different mindset. There are very few brands do both traditional retail and direct consumer and, and get it right. And mm -hmm. you know, almost everyone in our business is a direct consumer background or, or no prior experience. And very few people have done traditional retail and therefore our mindset is is e-com and customer and data and analysis and and optimization on the site you can't just turn on a website and expect it to work it's a very very complicated skill yeah yeah great answer um wayne says james touched on speaking to his head of people earlier but how did you deal with all your staff when the announcement was made to work from home if possible so yeah maybe just that initial announcement and the reaction you had uh if you want to get a bit more info so we we mainly followed government advice, or we did follow government advice. So that was our that was our lead. The tricky thing for us is that we've got New York, Birmingham, London, and and a village in Hertfordshire, 
and <laughs> you've got sort of the mayor of New York saying one thing and then you've got people traveling on on London Underground for the London office so our our London and Birmingham New York teams went into lockdown before HQ and we at the time we basically emailed pretty much every day to say what the latest was and here's what the government advice is and here's what we'd, we'd like you to do so it, I think like a lot of brands we've just communicated far more regularly than we normally would do and we try and avoid email we use Slack quite a bit and a lot of video calls but email was sort of became a bigger deal for a period of time yeah and now it's sort of a bit calmer but then we had lots of individual conversations with the leads of each offices so we, we um yeah we followed government advice and, and did um accordingly to the region we were in uh, great one uh so josh says do you see any future trends in the health food and drink industry Ooh. i don't know if happened in the last month or in general but... <laughs> uh good question i mean the tough thing for now is that when everyone's in their their home your 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 behavior is very different to what it might be in the future so mm -hmm. if there are companies trying to ben you know, benefit now or change their mindset now fine how many of those will last for a prolonged period of time i'm not sure there will be future trends i think yeah online food and drink sure that should that should grow to a whole new level beyond that's really hard to predict and what if we you know when when things are back to normal the favorite phrase that people use Will it be 99% the same as it was before? Will it be 70%? If it's 99%, there are fewer opportunities. If it's 70%, there'll be loads of things that we might be doing differently, like you know, business travel, as I said, I think, I think that will drop down heavily. Um, will people go out less? I don't know. I think we're kind of wired as humans to want to interact with each other and see people, but if yeah. people are scared, um, I think there might be a prolonged period of, of people of um, certain age groups, or LV age groups, or people with uh, pre-existing health conditions and asthma and things might be socializing less so do you have a smaller circle of friends do you do, you, do people want to spend more time in public spaces do people want to be in sort of forests and gardens mention your forest there do people not want to be in cities so much and there'll be less sort of impulse on the go so all sorts of things may not happen it's really hard to see um what the prolonged um change might be it is, it is indeed. Um, so um going to wrap up now, taking a, a lot of your time. I know you're an incredibly busy man, so appreciate your time here. Um, any last questions for James? Um, Sonny says, has Huel ever used influencer marketing? If not, why not? <laughs> not much. We've tried it a bit more recently. I think we're quite lucky in that we benefit from natural influencer marketing and people, yeah. people want to be associated with us. Uh, there's an argument that says that sort of micro influences are stronger than someone who's got a million fans who's been paid to uh, promote a product and have hashtag ad on it. Whereas someone who's just genuinely likes the brand and says, wow, I really think this is cool. Um, you know, we've had posts in the past from Niall Horan from One Direction who's got a million fans and it didn't sort of move the needle. Whereas a, a you know, blog post or a podcast or something uh, or a, a bit of TV might change or a bit of radio actually. Radio is really good for us when, when we've been on the radio. So various things out there so it's not a big focus for us no we're much more uh, focused on our natural community and, and interact with people on a one-to-one on one -one level which arguably is less efficient but we can give a better authentic um conversation mm, and yeah and I, I think again i think you definitely lend yourself to having the like natural organic influences that you have through, through the hero guns um what is your priority what is what is your priority what is Huel's priority for the next four weeks private question that's come through yeah making sure our team are okay is the biggie good answer yeah yeah i think it's been hard hard for them hard to include myself in that group um they're generally in a good place we're generally set up to be fairly virtual like this but it's going to start graying on people even more if we're, if we're if we're stuck at home for a longer period of time so yeah lots of regular check-ins we do a thing called brew wednesday as well where every wednesday people have a cup of tea or a brew or whatever they want and and, and uh, have a chat and something non-work related so keep keeping sort of morale up and keeping people chatting um mm. stocks is the other big one so keeping in stock we're actually in a really good place the last sort of week or two production's gone very well all the raw materials have turned up so that's a big e um and then a, and then a smooth customer experience i mentioned that we had a tough time a few weeks ago where we said too much volume to, to what we're normally used to and we probably didn't give the great experience but making sure we're there for customers making sure we give the right information making sure we talk to them 
making sure everything's kind of seamless on on our website and um, constantly improving. I think the challenge right now is that most companies are sort of doing day to day, and we were doing sort of hour to hour at one stage. We've got hmm. daily management meetings every morning. We've now moved that to three times a week, and yeah. we should probably go back to weekly at some stage. But you need to start planning further ahead. Mm. Otherwise, you just get your head down here and you're just focusing on day to day, and you can't yeah. spot something that's happening in a year's time. So we've got a board meeting on Friday. And I love board meetings because it forces you to, to think fur- further ahead. So, yeah, but sort of here and now we're fairly stable and let's start planning ahead and, and try not to slow down too much. Yes, it's, it's the uncertainty, isn't it? And, and especially in relation to the staff, you see like the, the longer people are in lockdown and you say it's just like head down, just getting through each day. But at some point in time, you need to be looking beyond what's in front of you, don't you? And it's, I don't know, do you take, do you take any light at the end of the tunnel from seeing what's happening, like maybe Germany, Austria, where it's starting to open things up. I mean, obviously kind of expected Germany to be the most uber efficient country out there, but um, yeah. 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 <laughs> I think Switzerland seems to have done a good job as well. I saw their, yeah. their loan scheme for, for, for small businesses was basically got automatically approved within 24 hours, whereas in the UK, I know it's a much bigger country and more complicated, but it's been a month since they announced it. And, I know businesses where not much has changed and particularly if you're a fast growing business losing money, which a lot of startups are, you the computer said no. Initially it said have a personal guarantee to have the loan and then, yeah. then it was um well actually no unless you've got unless you're in profits, they're not gonna back you. So lots of you know big brands have made losses and then eventually become profitable. When you look at Facebook, it started made losses for many, many years and now it's one of the biggest brands in the world. So you have to back mm. small businesses and support them and I think it's starting to happen. Um, yeah. Nice. Um, and I'll, I'll f- finish up with then, and we, we use this question for a video montage with everybody that we interview. But if you had a million pounds to invest in an industry today, what would it be, James? So I think something that's helpful for where we are now, but also something that would be a sustained change is video health service. So I actually use Babylon. I think Babylon's a wonderful app, straight business. I used it before Christmas and again in January. And I'm a person who doesn't like to kind of hang around. And I just got booked an appointment on my phone. I saw a GP, took four minutes, sorted it out. I don't want to go and queue and wait for a doctor's surgery and presenting because they're ill people. So Mm. um, I remember getting a random question from a a GP, a, a a National Health Service sort of questionnaire like a couple of years ago on the phone saying, would you use a video GP? And I was like, yeah, definitely use a video GP. It's so much more efficient. Mm. And if you've got someone, say you've got kind of five GPs in London and hundreds of people trying to see them, and you've got another five in Manchester who happen to be less busy, well, yeah. if they, one of them can see me. It's a bit like Uber. You know, Uber's all about um, matching driver demand and supply together and saying, well, actually, mm. that person, they, they don't know that they're both free and they, they can match each other up. So I think yeah. Babylon and, and other brands like that should just have a you know great time of things and it should be much better for everyone. We should, we should see... GPs quicker and it should be much more efficient for everyone and, and it should change uh, it should be cheaper cost and it should reduce our um, our strain on the health service yeah no g- g- good answer haven't, haven't haven't had that one yet so I like that one haven't heard of Babylon either to be honest with you so nice um well look thank you everybody for your questions really appreciate a super engaged audience wouldn't expect anything different when we've got our CEO of Cure here obviously um so James thank you for your time um thank you keep connected and um yeah look forward to to reading about continued progress with Kewl and and hope you know all the kinks in the business get ironed out and um hopefully we'll get let outdoors soon thank you thanks for the questions guys loved it appreciate it thanks james take care now thank you bye-bye